Hi, this is Pat Fiorello here, and I'd like to welcome you to today's painting lesson. I've been a professional artist and a painting instructor for over 25 years, and I'm excited to help you learn, grow, and have fun with your painting. Today we're going to be doing a lesson on painting flowers. It's going to be in an outdoor garden setting, and our focus is going to be on getting brilliant color for our flowers, as well as a sensation of sunlight in the painting. Now, I know flowers can be a challenging and sometimes even intimidating subject for artists. The shapes of the flowers can be so complex that sometimes we put pressure on ourselves to get things exactly perfect and get every petal in place. And we really don't need to do that in order to capture the essence and beauty of flowers. And I'm going to share with you today a method that I have found over the years helps me to stay loose and free while painting flowers while still capturing their beauty and spirit. So let's take a look at the materials that we'll be using for today's painting. But before we jump into the specific materials, I do want to take a moment just to talk about color and paint because a lot of times students are frustrated with mixing color and they wonder, you know, why do we have so many colors? Artists do sometimes work with a limited palette of just yellow, red, and blue. But I find for flowers, um, I really enjoy using a fuller palette of the, the full spectrum. And some of the flowers have really vibrant, vivid colors. And it's hard to get some of those colors with just three paints. Even though theoretically you could mix paints to get those colors, in actuality, um, it, it becomes difficult to get the kind of colors that are vibrant and found in flowers. So one of the challenges is we all understand the color wheel, yellow, red, and blue being the primary colors, and we can mix the secondary colors from those. We learn that in elementary school, and, and uh, you know, so we have that knowledge. But then when it comes to mixing the paints, um, it becomes more frustrating. So why is that? And one of the reasons is there's a gap between the theoretical color wheel of yellow, red, and blue and what's actually in your paint tubes. So I wanted to share a little bit of thinking behind that that might help you when we get to the mixing color. So even though there's a theoretical yellow on the color wheel, when we have our paints, we might have three or four different yellows that have different biases. So for example, a cadmium yellow lemon leans a little bit towards green. A cadmium yellow may lean a little bit towards orange or red. So neither one is the pure theoretical yellow, and um, that's where we get into some difficulty. So the more that we know and understand our paints, the easier it's going to be for you to mix the color that you want to get to. So as I go through the uh, colors that I'm using, I'm going to share with you what they are and why I use them, why I have them on my palette. I've put out everything today. Uh, we may or may not use all of these, but I like to have them out and ready to go. Um, I want to be in the ready position. I don't want to be looking for a paint tube that's going to break into my momentum while I'm painting. So I put everything out. If I use it, I use it. If I don't, I don't. But I've got it here. I kind of consider this my all-you-can-eat buffet. I've got everything out, and then I can pick. I'll have a little bit of this. No, nah, I'm not going to use any of that. I need a lot of this. But I have it, everything ready. I have all my options available. So let's get right to the, um, the paints. Uh, just they are on a, a glass palette. That is what I like to use. Um, it's easy to clean, uh, easy to mix on, um, and you know, very helpful to have that. In my own studio at home, I just um, took an old watercolor frame, 16 by 20, that had a glass top to it took out a painting and put in a gray piece of foam core so that I had a middle value gray to compare to when I'm mixing colors. So if I need something that's light and I compare and it matches this gray, I know I need to get it lighter. Um, and I have a similar um, setup here. The first color that we have here is Indian yellow. Indian yellow um, is a transparent yellow. It is something that will be very helpful for the painting that we're going to do today and the method that I use. So if it's not one that you have, you may want to pick that up because there isn't any other color that really could substitute for that. The other yellows that I have on my palette or that are more common all are opaque yellows, so they're not going to help us in the first stage of the painting. So Indian yellow 
is a very important color to have. Then I move on to these two cadmium yellows. And just like I said earlier, the cadmium lemon, when you look at it compared to the cadmium yellow, you can see it's got a little bit of a greener cast. So if I want to mix a green, a bright green, this might be a great choice because it's already on its way to green. Compare that to cadmium yellow, and you might have cadmium yellow light, deep, cadmium yellow, there's a few of them. But this cadmium yellow, you can see compared to the cadmium lemon, it's got more of an orangey cast. It's moving on its way towards orange. It's got a touch of red in there. So neither one of these is pure yellow. They have a bias, one towards green, one towards red. It's helpful to understand and think about that because when you go to mix your paints, what's in the tube is more important than necessarily the theoretical uh, yellow. Next, we go into yellow ochre, and I prefer the yellow ochre pale or yellow ochre light. Um, this is a color you could live without. You can certainly mix it from your other colors, but it is awfully convenient to have. If I need to dull down a color quickly, I can grab that and add it to um, another color. If I want to make a more muted green, for example, I might grab that instead of one of the brighter yellows. So I do ha like to have that on my palette. This next color is called Transparent Earth Orange. Um, I think only one or two brands make it, but um, I like it. Again, you could live without it. Um, if you mixed uh, the Indian yellow with, say, a permanent rose or uh, transparent oxide red, you could get to an approximation of that color. But um, I do like to have it, and uh, if I can go directly to a color, it just makes things easy for me. So I do enjoy that specifically on the first layer of the painting that we'll be doing today, where I might need uh, a little bit of a muted uh, warm tone to, to tone that part of the canvas. The next color is Transparent Oxide Red, a very, very useful color to have. I use it a lot. Um, that has substituted for Burnt Sienna. They're very similar in color characteristics, but this Transparent Oxide Red is, to me, cleaner uh, burnt Sienna is an earth color and um, feels a little bit dirty sometimes. And this uh, transparent oxide red is a very clean, transparent color. It's beautiful for mixing with your blues to get neutral browns and grays. Uh, also works well mixing with the Viridian to get a really rich, clean green. So super handy to have that on your palette. Okay, the next color on my palette is cadmium orange. Um, I don't always put it out, and you could, of course, make that between a cadmium yellow and a cadmium red. However, um, I like it. I don't think the mixture is ever as bright as that cadmium orange out of the tube. Uh, that's just my own bias on that. And today's painting, we are going to be doing some sunlit geraniums that might need some orange, so why not have it out? It's just like a happy, joyful color. Um, next, we have cadmium red light and cadmium red. I don't always put both of them out. However, um, again, today we're going to be doing a painting that's got a lot of red in it, so I'll, I'll have them both available. You can compare them on the palette and see that the cad red light skews a little bit more towards orange. Um, maybe it has a little yellow hidden in there. And then the cad red is more of a, a pure uh, kind of tomato red there. And then we're moving on to other reds that are cooler reds. So again, how do you know if it's warmer or cooler? Um, the warmer colors tend to lean more towards yellow and red. Cooler colors tend to lead more towards blue. So as I move to these other reds on my palette, you can see they all lean towards a violet, purple, blue, much more so than these that lean towards orange. But I've got a few colors out here. Again, I could live with one, but I like to have my options open. Um, I've got permanent rose. Um, if I want to do some, say, pink flowers, permanent rose is great because it gives me really a pure pink, especially when I mix it with white. Some of the other reds, if I mix with white, like the cadmium reds, can actually get a little bit chalky. They don't have that vibrancy of um, kind of a hot pink if I need that. And then alizarin also doesn't give me a totally pure pink. So if I love that permanent rose for flowers. Also, it's a great mixer with the blues to get a pure purple. I don't have a pure purple on my palette, um, but I can easily mix that with permanent rose and, and any of the blues. 
Um, alizarin is kind of a traditional workhorse color. It's a cool red. Uh, it helps darken things as well, and it is a transparent color. And then I have permanent magenta. It's not a lot different than alizarin. I could live without it, but sometimes I like it to um, alter the alizarin a little bit without having to go all the way to blue to, to make that color cooler and darker. And then we've got blues. Again, I don't always put all the blues out, but um, just for um, instructional purposes and for uh, having options available, I'll, I'll have all of them out today. Um, the first one is cerulean blue. You can see that blue, compared to the other blues, leans a little greener. Um, then I've got cobalt blue, which to me is the closest to the true blue on the color wheel. And um, then the last is ultramarine blue, and that's probably the blue that I use the most of. Um, again, it's great for making things darker, um, great for mixing greens, great for mixing grays. It's really a very versatile color. And then I have a few other colors here in the greens. Um, this is like a cadmium green. It is an opaque color. I don't use it very often, but um, it's very vibrant and mixes kind of interesting uh, muted greens when I mix it with some of the other colors like orange and that. So I have it here just in case. I may or may not use it. We'll see. I have a transparent yellow green. Uh, another substitute for that could be a green gold. Um, and again, it, that's transparent and it's a little bit more of a muted green. And then I've got Viridian, which is another kind of workhorse on my palette. I use that a lot, um, especially to make greens. And we'll have a little bonus section on this video about mixing natural greens, because some of these greens right out of the tube uh, really can't be used directly to get natural greens. We need to warm them up to uh, have a feeling of a, a nature green. And then lastly, well, of the colors, I have transparent brown oxide. Again, you could live without it. I can make something close to that between ultramarine blue and the transparent oxide red. But um, I like to have it available. I can mix that with the Viridian and get a really nice, rich, rich, deep green. Um, that's a transparent color as well. And then my whites down here, I have just a regular titanium white. Put a lot of that out because I do use a fair amount of that, particularly in of course, in the lights. But I also put out Naples yellow because adding white to a color will make it cooler. White is a very cold color. And the minute I put white into another color, it's not only going to lighten it, it's also going to cool it off. In some areas of my painting that might be in the sunlight, maybe I don't want to cool off a color, yet I need to bring up the value. In that case, I might defer to the Naples yellow, which will lighten it without making it colder. So those are the colors I have. Um, and importantly, I put them out in the same order every time I paint. OK, so now we've seen the materials we're going to need for today's painting. We've got our plan together. And before we start actually putting paint on the canvas, I want to take a couple of minutes and share with you an overview of the process that we're going to be using. It may be different than what you're used to, and if so, that's great because we're here to learn and get beyond our comfort zone. But I want to share with you where we're going so you know what to expect. So the method that I use that I love for flowers is the transparent color underpainting method. And uh, the reason why I love to use this method, I think it's ideal for flowers, is um, threefold. Number one, it helps me maintain clean, clear colors, brilliant colors. Um, if you have paintings of flowers that kind of get muddy colors, they look dead, they look drab. And for flowers, you need brilliant color. If you think about nature and look out there, the most brilliant colors are flowers, you know, maybe fruit also, but those things are brilliant colors. The rest of the landscape has a lot of more neutralized colors. Um, the greens out there are grayed greens. The distant mountains may be more neutralized. But for flowers, we want vibrancy. We want them to feel like they're real and in front of us on the table in a bouquet. So clean, clear colors, vibrant colors is a big benefit. Number two, and related to that, is luminosity. Uh, luminosity is just kind of that inner glow that the painting has. And um, 
I learned a lot in my watercolor days. I, I did watercolor for about 10 or 12 years prior to starting oils. And watercolors have the benefit of having a luminous glow to them. And that's because you're seeing the white of the paper glow through the transparent colors and back to your eye. Um, and if you think about things that are backlit like that is, um, those are the most brilliant things you can find, like a, a stained glass window. If you see the stained glass window, the light's coming from behind through the clear colors and to your eye. So I'm borrowing a little of that luminosity idea and bringing that to the oil painting. Of course, we are going to build with opaque paints, um, so not all of that transparent layer will be showing at the end, but um, some bits will be showing and you'll see little sparkles here and there. So clean color, bright color, luminosity. And then the third benefit is I find this approach really freeing and fun. Uh, flowers are beautiful, they bring us joy, there, there's a happiness about them, and um, sometimes we can really get caught up in trying to make them perfect, get, painting petal for petal to get everything exact, and we really don't need to do that to capture the beauty and the, the essence of flowers. So this approach starts out very loose, uh, with that loose attitude, you're free, you can change anything, um, I'm not uptight. I'm not even doing any drawing in the beginning. I'm just massing in the big shapes of color and covering my whole canvas. So it, it frees me up. If you are getting uptight anywhere in your painting, you'll feel that energy in your body like tighten up and your energy will show up on the canvas. So if you're uptight, if you are worried or being a perfectionist, is it going to show up on the canvas? If you feel free, relaxed, just having a joyful afternoon painting, that's going to show up on the canvas. So this method helps me be free and not worry about getting things exact or perfect because I'm starting out with a very loose, uh, generalized attitude. So those are the benefits. We have fresh, clean color, we have luminosity, and a free, fun attitude. Now, how do we do the method? Well, it's very simple. There are two major stages. There's stage one, where we are blocking in on the canvas the big, colorful shapes. And we block in over the whole canvas. We will use thin paints, transparent colors only, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. When we have the whole canvas covered, then we shift to stage two. That's when we bring out all the rest of our paints, any opaques that you want to use, white, all of the, the paints can be used. And now we're developing the painting further, creating form, and eventually getting to some necessary details. Not all the details, but a few details, enough to suggest um, the scene that we want to communicate. I do have um, on the video, there's a one-page handout that you can print out um, that summarizes the difference between stage one and stage two. So if this method is new to you, you can print this out and keep it with you in your studio while you're painting so that you remember uh, the distinctions between those two stages. And then also, I have um, a second handout that summarizes the transparent and opaque colors. Sometimes if you haven't necessarily been pay paying attention to that before in your painting, um, you may not know which are the transparent and which are the opaque. So there are many options uh, in both types of paint, and this is just a list that I put together that gives suggestions for what's available for the primary colors, the secondary colors, and even some neutrals. Now, you don't need to have all these colors, believe me, don't worry about that, but I'm just giving you an idea that there are colors available that are transparent in any um, color that you're looking for. So that's one way that you could know what's transparent or not. The other thing is um, you can look on your paint tubes. And not all the manufacturers have this, but many do. And on the back of your paint tubes, there's a small box. And if the box is clear, like this first one here, then that means it's see-through, it's transparent. If the box is colored in, that means it blocks out the light, it's, it's opaque. And then you might have one in the middle that's half and half. But for our purposes, like here's a lizard in crimson, that is definitely a transparent color, and so on the back of the paint tube is that empty box. Cadmiums, so this is cadmium red, but all cadmiums, just so you know, are opaque. So we're not going to use those in stage one, but we can use them freely in stage two. So this will also help you identify which are transparent, which are opaque. 
Again, not all brands have this, but some brands actually have it written on the back where it'll say transparent or opaque. And some even have it in the name, like transparent oxide red. So it's not that hard to figure out which are transparent and opaque. Over time, it will become second nature. And um, so you've got uh, what you need for stage one. Now, since this approach is um, maybe new to you, might be a little bit different than you've done before, I want to show you what to expect, because it might be a little um, uh, non-traditional. So I want to show you an example of, of a painting going through the process. So this is a painting I did recently of a bouquet. I actually arranged the bouquet in a flower arranging class that I took. And they're you know, mostly orange flowers. and um, so what I did in stage one is I'm looking at the flowers and I'm blocking in um, the vibrant colors that I see. I'm overshooting it. I'm going more vibrant than I really need to so that I've got some place to go from. It's very easy to dull down a color, but once you dull it down, it's very hard to recapture the vibrancy. So if my aim is to have vibrant flowers in the end, um, I want to preserve that as much as possible. So I'm exaggerating that in the beginning, knowing I could always dial it back. So once I get in the colors of the flowers and the foliage, then I fill in the background with another color, and then I've got the whole canvas covered. That's the end of stage one. It may look super bright, but don't worry, we're going to um, resolve it from there. In stage two, we start blocking in and um, can bring in all our paints, again, the whites, the opaques, everything. And we're going to the areas where we want to dull things down and complete those areas. And then still thinking about where do we want to retain the vibrant, transparent colors. And in the end, this was the final painting. And you can see it was a big leap from here to get to here. But we're resolving um, the different parts of the painting as we're going along. So that's the two-stage process. Here's another example um, that you can see from a, a, a live painting. And um, this is the painting. This is just a little small study of uh, garden roses that I did. And this was at the end of stage two, the finished painting. But where I was at the end of stage one was here. So you may look at that and say, oh, wow, that's really bright. Yes, it's going to be super bright at the end of stage one. It's going to be garish. And you're going to say, this doesn't look like a painting. But um, I wanted you to see this because we're going to get to the end of stage one and you're going to be wondering how is this going to turn out. Don't worry, it will. It's like baking a cake. If you were baking a cake and it said bake for 40 minutes and you took it out of the oven after just 10 minutes, you're going to say, oh, it doesn't look like a, a cake. I guess I don't know how to bake a cake. But relax, hang in there with me. We're just going to continue to develop it in stage two to end up with the painting that, um, that we wanted to create. So that gives you a bit of an idea of the path that we're going to be on with this two-stage process. And with that, let's move on and actually jump into the painting for stage one. OK, now that we've done our planning, we're ready to dive into the painting. And uh, what might be different with this method than the methods you've used before is that we are going to do an underpainting, but that underpainting is going to have different colors in it. Many times people will tone their canvas, maybe with a neutral color like a burnt sienna or burnt umber. But for flowers, I don't like to put those neutrals underneath because I'm trying to retain the brilliance of the colors. And if I want a brilliant pink or a brilliant red, um, putting that on top of a neutralized color um, kind of defeats the purpose a little bit, at least in my mind. So I like to go in the white canvas and come in on top with the transparent layer of colors. So since we're going to be diving into color first, I want to um, hopefully uh, clear up some confusion around color. I know I had this confusion for a long, long time. And I hear people talking about color temperature, cool colors, warm colors. And I generally understood like the warmer colors leaned more towards yellows and reds, like the sun and fire. You know, that was the, the tip for thinking about the warm colors. And the cool colors were more like blue, like the ocean. So generally, I understood what was warm and what was cool, and the fact that they were warm and cool relative to one another. Like when I showed you in the materials, the lemon yellow was cooler, it leaned green, than the cadmium yellow, which was warmer, that leaned red. So um, 
but then when you go to apply that to like, well, how do I interpret that in a scene or my photo or my painting, um, I seem to have a lot of confusion on what was warm and what was cool. And I would hear people say phrases like, warm light, cool shadows, cool light, warm shadows. And um, it generally made sense, but um, I think that there's more. And if you understand more about how color and light work, you can be looking for that then in your scene, whether you're painting from a photo, a still life, or actually out on location. So the way that I think of it and kind of made sense of it for myself is that there are four things contribute to our viewing color. First is the local color of something. So imagine you have an apple, and it's a red apple. The local color is red. The color, as if there was no light on it at all, you could imagine that color was red. Consider that the local color. It's kind of the base color. So that's where you start. Then you have the effect of light on color. And you might have a warm light, which could be the sunshine. It could be a warm light in your studio. But that warm light will take that red and move it towards the orange. It's making it warmer than the original local color. You could have a cool light. Could be a still life in your studio. Uh, back in the days of Rembrandt and all those guys, they'd have a lot of um, paintings with the north light coming into the, their studio window, and that would maintain a consistent light over time. So they liked that north light. It was a cooler light. So if you're doing a painting of a cool light, um, you will probably have warm shadows, but you'll you'll have the influence of the light on your subject. So if I was painting that same apple under cool light, it might go a little bluer, or maybe it would be light and a little bluer. Um, but that's not the only effect. So warm light, cool shadows, cool light, warm shadows is a good kind of first cut at it, but there might be other subtle things to be looking for, and I want to mention them now because they might influence the colors that we're going to put on our canvas throughout the painting. You also could have some indirect light. So while you might have that apple out in the sunshine, you might have some indirect light from the sky that's hitting certain planes of the, the apple. So while the, the sunny side might have warmth, there might be other spots where there might, might be some little cool notes um, in the apple. Um, and the same thing goes for cool. You might be in a setting where you have um, generally cool light, but maybe there's a secondary light that's warm that, that's hitting an area, and then you would bring in a, a warm tone. And then the last area is you might have reflected light. So what's surrounding something bounces light into it often. So you might have that apple, and it's red, and but it's sitting on um, you know a green shelf, and some of that green is bouncing you know maybe into the shadow or another area of the apple. So you have the local color that you start out with. You have the color of the light influencing your shape, or your object. And then you could have indirect light, which might be the opposite temperature of the direct light. And then you also could have reflected or bounced light. So the warm light, cool shadows is a good start. Um, but you might want to look for some of those other color notes. So, um, I'll mention that as we're moving along, but I wanted to just set that up because it's just not automatic that it's definitely warm and cool. Now, in this scene that we're painting today, it's um, a photo from an outdoor setting. It was in the sunny Tuscany, so we definitely had warm light, and so that's what I'm going to push and exaggerate. Uh, one of my favorite painters is Joaquin Soroya, and he was a master at depicting um, sunlight. Uh, he just got the luminosity of it, and he really pushed those differences between warm light, cool shadows, um, warmth like yellow in the, in the whites, and like a lavender in the shadows, and he really exaggerated those differences. And as a result, when you look at the paintings, you get that sensation of sunlight. So he's kind of my true north to think about when I think about uh, light and shadow and getting a, a sunlight effect. So that was part of our, our lesson for today is how do we make this scene, have the colors be luminous and bright, but also get a sensation of sunlight. So with that, we're going to get started. We have our plan. Remember, I know where things generally are going to go because I did my value sketch. 
and I'll just put that down here so I can refer to it as her painting. And next we're going to just tackle the canvas. So um, I'm going to just basically put down colors of shapes. Now, remember I started before saying the language of art. We have shape, color, value, and edges. We're putting down the colors of shape, not the colors of things necessarily, but the colors of shapes. So when I'm starting to put down the shape of the flowers, I'm putting down maybe the shape of the light, um, light planes of the flowers and not necessarily the shadows. There might be five white flowers, but I might be able to group together or mass the light of all those five flowers. So let's just jump in and see what that looks like. I have my paints out. And I'm, remember, I'm going to use a tiny, tiny bit of medium that's half Gamsol, half linseed oil, or another oil of your choice. So I've already got that pre-mixed, um, very, very tiny amount. In order to kind of keep it um, uh, an equal mixture, I just use like a little dropper, and I'll put in like five drops of Gamsol and five drops of linseed oil. That'll probably be plenty for what I need just to cover this initial stage of the canvas, and then we'll be done with it. But I'll take one of my soft brushes, um, dip a little bit into that medium, and the first thing I'm going to go for is the white flowers. The white flowers are my center of interest. That's my focal point. That i got to get the placement of that first. Um, when I think about this, I think like I'm a Broadway play director. This is my stage. Where am I going to put my star? Maybe, you know, I have Meryl Streep, and she's going to go in the primo place here with the best lighting, and then all the extras have got to line up to support her. They're the supporting cast. So I want to pick the prime real estate for my main center of interest, and then every, and everything else will line up around that. So because those are white flowers, and they're in warm light, I'm going to push them yellow. Now, I don't want them to end up to be yellow flowers, but remember, this stage, we're just setting the stage for what's to come. I am going to put white on top in stage two, but I want the yellow there for that glow of sunlight to come through. And there might be little bits where I skip later, and I don't necessarily cover all the underpainting up, because I want little bits of that warm to glow through and kind of vibrate next to the cool white that's going to come on top of it. So I'm taking the Indian yellow, which is my only transparent yellow that I have, and mixing it with a tiny bit of that medium. I don't want this runny. I don't want it drippy. I want to be able to control the placement of it, but I don't want it thick. I don't want impasto. And I know from my value sketch, I'm going to have it about these flowers about a third of the way over. Again, I'm not doing every flower individually. I'm trying to mass where these flowers would go. And I've got the sunlit part of the flowers. So that's a shape. I'm looking also at my reference photo and seeing where is the brightest sunlit part of these flowers. Now, the whole attitude of this part of the painting, totally free, loose, I'm using a big brush as a shape maker, um, and I know I can change anything at any point. If I don't like it, I can wipe it off and start again. But I'm just getting a general placeholder for where the sunlight on these flowers is going to go. And then I come to where is the shadow on these flowers. And, um, you know, I look at my photo reference, and what color is the shadow of the flowers? It's, it's a color you really can't name. It's kind of greenish. It's, you know, it's a greenish, a grayish. Um, maybe some of the foliage from around the, the flowers is bouncing back into the shadow side. So they're not cool like they're blue, but they're cooler than um, the yellow that I have in for the lit, lit part. So I might take a little bit of that transparent green uh, gold um, or transparent yellow green, the different brands call them different names, and take a little bit of that and now put in the shadow shape of the cluster of flowers. This is not one flower. This might represent five or six flowers. I don't even really care how many flowers there are. I'm just going for the mass of the light of this this grouping of flowers. And then I'll look for where is there a shadow area 
I'm going to take a tiny bit of my transparent oxide red and kind of make that a little less green. And then I brought back a little more green. So there's a shadowy, duller side underneath these flowers. So that's my shape of my light flowers that are going to be the star of the show here. Let's move on and work for some of the other flowers. Now, the colors that I see in my reference, again, I don't need to copy those exactly. Our job is not to copy the photo. Our job is to take that photo as inspiration, as information. You know, we take it again like that buffet. Here's all the information. Include what you want, delete what you don't want. What, and how do you decide what, what belongs? You know, we've already decided what the story is about this. It's about sunlight over this row of, of flowers in the pots. Um, I want it to feel joyful, like Italy. Um, so anything that helps that story, we can include. Um, anything that helps the design of this painting, we can include. If it doesn't help the design or it doesn't help the story, leave it out. Um, just because it's there, is not a good reason to include it in your painting. So don't feel obligated to include anything that you don't want. The other flowers I want to put in here, there's a big grouping of orangey red flowers here that also are in sunlight. So let me get those in. Again, I, I can take this brush because this brush only had yellow and a little bit of this green in here. So it's, it's clean enough for me to use for the orange. And maybe I'll take that, in, that Indian yellow again as my base. And, you know, a little bit of the permanent rose I can take with it to make kind of an orangey, uh, an orangey transparent color. And then I just look, where do I want those to be? Maybe I'll have one up here. There's a flower that's up here in the photo, but it faces outwards. For design purposes, I'm going to make it face inwards, so it's pointing back at my grouping of the white flowers. So again, you take what's there and make it work for your design. And we did the value sketch and all, but you'll see as I go along, everything I'm doing, I'm thinking about design. I didn't do the sketch, and now I'm done with design. Every stroke I'm making, every decision I'm making, I'm thinking about design. So as we go along with the painting, I'm going to show you what I'm doing, but I also want to explain how I'm thinking about it, because this lesson is important not only to produce this painting, but for you to have information and new ways of thinking to carry in your paintings as you move forward. So I'm going to bring that right up to there. OK, where else do I want some of these orange flowers? Um, I'll push them here. OK, so I've got some of the orange there. And the orange you know, in the shadow gets a little bit cooler. So I think I'll take maybe a little of the alizarin and a little of the transparent oxide red and make something that's a little bit of a, a cooler red for the bottom. Again, these colors are going to be brighter than then we need them to be ultimately, but I'm giving myself room to pull back on the intensity later and still have this glow underneath. And then we've got at the end here some that are a little redder. Do I have to make them redder? No, but you know, it gives me some variety. I have harmony here. I've got, you know, these warm tones, oranges leading into reds. Um, so I like that idea. So I am going to use that. Um, and um, maybe I'll use some of that same color, but just make it slightly more red. So I added a little bit more alizarin. But for the lip part, I'll add a little bit more orange back in. So I'm thinking of this as sort of like a whole uh, kind of shape of color, a band of color that's going to go across. And again, these, of course, will be white later. But I want this whole thing, rather than 30 flowers, to read as one band of color. So I'm blocking in where I want these flowers to go. 
And then at the end here, I've got flowers that are mostly in shadow. So I'm going to take that mixture that I had with the alizarin, maybe throw in a little transparent oxide red to make it a little darker, and maybe even a tiny bit of ultramarine blue. Now remember, I'm using only transparent colors here. Uh, but this whole area is um, in shadow, which works for me composition-wise. I like that because it keeps me in the painting. I don't just, if there's another light flower here, I might just zip out the edge. I don't want that. I like the fact that this blocks it and keeps you in. Um, and also, it's got the contrast of that shadow right against the brilliant light. So that's going to help me when I, I want to get to the point of um, describing the sunlight on, these, on this whole section of flowers. So I'm just, you can see, kind of loosely putting in a shape of where these flowers are going to go. Um, you know, it, they're not flowers yet, you know, they are just shapes. Think about design-wise, maybe having this come down a little bit than where this, this is. Always thinking design. So I've got my band of colors going here. I did notice um, in the photo, and again, this is something you can choose to put in or not put in, but I did notice that there were some purple flowers in there. And I, so I had to make a decision on that. Do I include them or not? And this painting is dominantly with sort of this reddish-orange family. And I've got a lot of green from the foliage. So I was thinking the triad of like orange, green, and purple. That's the secondary triad, the three secondary colors. That looks really nice together. Of course, I could leave it just, you know, this reddish, orange, and green, and it would be perfectly fine. But that purple, um, I think, would add a little something, maybe a little something unexpected. So um, I am going to, um, I think, save a place for that. I only see it in one place in the photo, but I'm going to make three places so it helps you move the eye around. Whenever you can repeat a color um, in two or three times, it helps kind of make a little triangle that your eye is moving around. So I'll just take a tiny bit of the ultramarine blue. Again, if it's thick, I want to add some of the, uh, the medium to it. And I'm just going to make a couple of placeholders for where I want this, you know, maybe a purple flower to go. So take a little blue. It's feeling like this is getting a little bit runny, so I'm going to add more paint because uh, maybe I have a little bit too much medium there. So this might be the shadow area for that purple flower. And then maybe, you know, maybe I'll add a little piece over here and maybe something here. And again, I can always change that later. And I'll put a little bit more shadow in for these other red flowers. So I've got light and shadow patterns coming across. setting up that little kind of rhythm of flowers going up and down. OK, so what we've got at the end of stage one, high chroma. It's very chromatic. It's more bright than we're going to end up with. But I set the stage for that glow and the bright colors. And then I can take away any colors that don't need to be that bright. So how do I go from here? So the next stage, we're going to build form. So I hadn't paid that much attention to light and shadow in the initial phase. Now we're going to really focus on that. How do we create form with a sense of light, shadow, through values, and pushing the color temperatures again? And um, you know what areas I might divine more, what areas I might leave a little bit loose. There are going to be areas where I definitely cover up some of this underpainting. And then there might be areas where I just leave some of that underpainting to glow through or leave it um, without a lot of detail. We don't want detail all over. Um, too much detail is like too much salt. You know, a little bit of salt can enhance your meal. Too much salt overpowers the meal. Hi, I'm Pat Fiorello, and welcome to my workshop. In 
this video, I'm going to be sharing a method that will help you get clean, vibrant, luminous color and also paint more loosely. Specifically, we're going to do a painting of an outdoor floral scene and we're going to focus on color and achieving a sense of sunlight. So as you can tell, I love flowers, I love to paint them, and my approach is to capture the essence of flowers, uh, capture their beauty, capture their joy, and also to capture their vivid colors. You know, all of that's important to me. At the same time, I don't want to restrict myself or put pressure on myself that I have to get in every petal to communicate what a flower is about. I think what's most exciting about this video for students is that it will release them from the pressure to have to get everything perfect and right. Um, we're painting for joy, we're painting to feel alive and create something, so I want to get students back in touch with the joy of painting and, and just creating something from nothing. You have some inspiration, but then I want you to bring your own sense of brushwork, design, and simplification to the whole process so that you can let go of trying to get things right. This video will help your painting skills in a couple of ways. Number one, in terms of technique, we'll be looking at um, how to mix clean colors, how to do a value sketch, how to plan out your painting, and there's even a bonus section on how to mix natural looking green, which is a, an area that's typically a frustration for painters. But we also spend time thinking about how to paint with intention, how to be deliberate about the design in your painting. Uh, you may do a little plan up front for your painting, but I want you to start thinking about um, design with every stroke that you're putting down. We are creating um, a work of art beyond just copying what we see in front of us. And I want you to get back into the feeling of that, the energy of that, the freedom of that, um, and the joy that that'll bring to your painting experience. So if you want to paint more loosely, you want to have fun with color, you want to learn how to simplify and suggest and let go of the pressure of having to do every last detail perfectly, uh, come join me on this video lesson and let's get started. I'm Pat Fiorello. I've been a professional artist and a painting instructor for over 25 years. I had a kind of an uh, unconventional uh, path to art. Um, I wasn't like many other artists that have always painted and, and drawn all their life. Um, in fact, when I was in the third grade, um, I had an art teacher who used to yell and scream a lot about cleaning up the paint. So. I um, wouldn't go to class. Uh, I would tell my mother I wasn't going to school because I didn't feel well on Mondays because I was avoiding art class um, until she figured out that's um, why I didn't want to go to school. So uh, I really didn't have a lot of um, engagement in art as a kid. Um, I did some kind of ceramics, you know, kind of pre-molded ceramics and painted on that, but uh, not a lot of painting and drawing on my own. I have to confess, I'm a type A overachiever. I went to college when I was 16. I have an MBA from the Harvard Business School. And I had a career as a marketing executive um, with two companies, Coca-Cola and Nabisco, um, by the time I was um, in my 30s. And it might sound great, but it was um, really uh, not very fulfilling. Um, it was kind of a, on a path to burnout. And um, sometimes I'd wake up and say, like, is this all there is? And um, at one point, I um, took a vacation, and I happened to take a one-hour watercolor class. I hadn't painted or drawn or anything since elementary school. But I took the one-hour class, and um, it was just so fun and enlivening. My painting looks like where I left off in the third grade, but um, the experience of it was so fun and energizing and uh, from there, um, I came home, and I was eager and hungry to learn. And I started taking classes at night after, after work. And uh, from there, I just um, you know, continued to get more and more immersed and probably obsessed with painting um, until ultimately I left that uh, first career to do um, art on a full-time basis. And that was back in 2002. 
Well, I don't know that the technique came um, that naturally. I did immerse myself in books, videos, classes to learn that. But what did come naturally was passion. I was very enthusiastic. Um, I was hungry to learn. And all of it just seemed uh, fascinating to me. So um, I think that's, you know, there was a natural spark there that was lit once I was exposed to painting. I think for me, it was not so much a particular class, but an experience that I had. Um, after painting only a short amount of time, like maybe a few months, somehow I got the idea in my head that it would be great to go to Europe and be an artist. And I, you know, quickly thought, well, no paycheck, no medical plan, you know, no 401k. I don't think I'm going to be doing that anytime soon. But um, magically, kind of that day, I found an artist magazine that was on a counter in, in the building that I lived in. And I opened it up and it said, um, go to France and paint for two weeks. And I thought, oh my God, I can have the dream and come back and have my day job. So I um, took the magazine up, called, signed up, and the next thing I'm in France, in Provence, painting for two weeks. Um, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I was just so new to painting. I didn't know what the whole thing was going to be about. But it was wonderful being immersed in art and being with other painters. And um, it really was uh, kind of life altering for me because what I learned um, was that beauty um, can transform us. Beauty can restore us. And I was awakened to the beauty around me, the, the sights, the smells, the sounds, but as I walked around, everything I wanted to paint. And at the end of that experience, I said, you know what, I want to just do this every year. And um, except for a couple years where we couldn't travel, um, I have been doing workshops uh, all over the place every year uh, just to go be immersed in art, be immersed in beauty. And I guess the lesson there is, you know, uh, I was led to painting, and then painting led me to beauty. And that really is my calling. That's my higher purpose for art. I feel as an artist, my job is to create and share beauty. And um, really, for over 20 years, that has been my true north. Um, you know, I kind of have my own little purpose or, or mantra for myself that I'm creating a world of beauty, love, and inspiration. And that's what I get up for every day. That's what I try to do in my own art, in my teaching, is to bring that beauty and inspiration to myself and others. So um, you know, that really was a pivotal moment for me, a defining moment, that trip to France. Yeah, I've absolutely had, um, you know, doubts along the way for sure. You know, the first one was the big, um, should I make the leap from one career to the other? And uh, just to be more aligned with what my purpose is, you know, I looked at my life and I said, if I'm really truly about creating and sharing beauty, I'm not doing a lot of that in my old job. And if I wanted to really get good as an artist, I needed to immerse myself in it. Doing it one day a week was not going to be enough to really um, develop myself fully as an artist. So uh, with that, though, when I left my first career, you know, I had a big question like, what do I do next to develop myself as an artist? And I thought about, you know, should I go to art school? Um, or, you know, what should I do? And I decided I really wanted to get good at painting specifically. And instead of going to a full art school, I decided to create my own art curriculum. So I sought out the best instructors and, um, th that I could get and go on workshops with them and, um, and just learned from people who I thought were excellent artists and excellent instructors. And that became my, my curriculum, my, my uh, kind of homemade art school, if you will. I put the pieces together myself. But because I didn't go to art school like formally, um, you know, you do have that doubt, like, well, you know, maybe um, I don't have the right training, or maybe I don't have what it takes. So, of course, you have those self-doubts. But I think as I continued um, to grow and sell my work, and I realized, you know, why do people buy a painting? They buy a painting because it touches them. It connects with them. It's something that they love. It's something that makes them feel good. And um, they don't go back and, you know, check out your resume to see how you got there. They go and they look at, you know, yourself being put into the painting. Like, that's what they're, they're re reacting to the painting, uh, not so much 
uh, how you got there. So once I kind of came to peace with that, I was like, you know what, it doesn't really matter if I went to art school or not. Um, I've learned from outstanding artists. I work hard at it. I you know, put my heart and soul in it. And I'm committed to creating beauty that uplifts people's lives. Um, and if they like that and they want it, fine. If not, fine. Uh, I'm painting for myself, for joy, for growth. And, um, and if I can share that with others, that's great. Um, but that's not the main objective. Over the years, I've gotten into um, you know a number of shows. I'd say you know close to maybe a hundred shows, and I've I entered um, first locally and then regionally, and now nationally, like American Impressionist Society and Oil Painters of America and No Apps. So I've gotten into those shows. I've had about twenty one-woman shows in various galleries and other venues. But some of the highlights, you know, I, I think about not so much awards and those kinds of accomplishments, but the rich experiences that I've had as an artist. And um, I love teaching. And just like I went as a student to that workshop in France, I began offering that to other students uh, back, I'd say, around 2008. And I've done about uh, 18 different workshops that I've led all over the world, uh, many in Italy, France, Spain. Um, and even New Zealand. I just came back from Sicily. And um, that brings me a lot of joy. And you know, at first, I looked at them as workshops, like what was the content that I was going to share. But once I got into it, I realized it's so much more than that. It's an enriching experience for the participants. So um, that's really been a joy um, to travel the world, see beautiful places, and help people experience those beautiful places through their art, artist's eyes. Um, I've also um, written a book uh, which has been published, which is uh, Bella Italia, Italy Through the Eyes of an Artist. And that shares about 80 of my paintings of Italy uh, from all my various workshops and travel there. Um, you can probably tell from my last name, I am Italian, Fiorello. And um, so uh, seeing Italy and sharing Italy through my artwork uh, in the book um, has been uh, one of the, the highlights of my, um, my art uh, career. You know, the finishing the paint, painting myself, you know, I love the um, immersion in it. You are so present. Uh, there's so many things to be uh, deciding while you're painting, the colors, the shape, the composition. You're, you're juggling all these balls at once. So you're all consumed and immersed, and I love that. Uh, you're not in your head thinking about what other things you should be doing. You are present in the moment with the painting. And uh, it's nice to see something go from the blank canvas to a finished creation. So, um, you know, of course, I love that. That keeps me going, and that's something I'm doing, you know, every week. Um, the teaching gives me access to people and interaction and a, a way to be generous with people, a way to contribute, a way to inspire. And um, I love, um, you know, seeing people eager to learn. I, you know, I always uh, say when I say my students, you know, if I talk to a random person on the street about my students, sometimes they might think I have, you know, young students. And like I said, my students are mostly adults over 50 who finally have time for themselves to paint, enjoy life, and, and do something creative or continue developing their own artistry. And um, to have people give themselves the gift of art, um, I, I love that. And to help them enjoy art more and get freed up. Um, if, if you are painting on your own, you kind of impose a lot of restrictions. I think we have a lot of things left over from school that we're supposed to do things a particular way. We're supposed to get the right answer. We're supposed to do this, all the shoulds. Um, and I like to be able to encourage people to loosen up about that, lighten up. This is about creating. This is about feeling alive, enjoying yourself. Um, so I feel real strongly about that, to, to give people the freedom to paint. Um, as an access to their own joy and aliveness. So, you know, which would, I, which would I prefer more? You know, I love them both, and they provide different things to me and allow me to provide different things to others. Well, um, for the past 25 years, I've painted in watercolors, and probably for about the past 15 years, I've painted in oils. Um, I'd say probably 90% of the paintings that I do now are oils. I still do watercolor sometimes when I'm teaching um, 
and uh, when I go on location sometimes, and also sometimes for commissions where people specifically want watercolor. But other than that, the rest of all my painting um, is uh, oil-based. For me, um, oil is kind of my continuing uh, leading edge to grow on. So um, I love the richness that I'm getting with it. There's a lot more freedom with it. Um, I don't necessarily have to draw so specifically up front. I can go in and more mass things and almost carve into the paint. So um, I really enjoy that. Um, I do paint both landscapes and florals. Uh, and it's funny, I, I like to do the landscapes in the watercolor more and I like to do the florals in the oils more. And I think I'm getting um, just the richness of the color, the depth of the, the color in oils for the florals. Um, and also you can get some nice texture which helps give the illusion of the petals without have a, having to draw in every petal. I can just do that you know, with a knife or layers on the brush. So um, that's the, uh, the medium that I use mostly these days. Well, my style, I'd say, you know, goes somewhere from realism to impressionism, uh, depending on the day, the mood, the subject matter, my intention for the painting. I, I do start out each painting with a clear intention, like why am I painting this? What am I trying to communicate or accomplish? What are the things that sparked excitement for me? Anytime you start a painting, and I always just share this with my students, you have to ask yourself, why are you painting this? And just saying, I like it, isn't enough. You need to cut deeper underneath, I like it. I like it doesn't tell you where to go with the painting. It just says it's pleasing to you. But if you cut into that and from the design elements of art, what are the contrasts that you like? You know, art is all about unity with variety. That's the essence of composition. When you boil down all the things you need to know about composition, you want to have unity that a painting hangs together. You want to have some variety, though, because too much sameness is boring. Boring. So we're constantly, you know, balancing those two features. So I asked myself, kind of in the language of art, what is it that sparked my interest here? Was it a contrast of colors, you know, a lot of red with a little accent of green? Was it a contrast of values, uh, you know, a bright sunlight with a lot of dark shadows around it? Um, I particularly love um, contrast of texture, like the soft organic shapes of flowers against maybe a rough stone wall in Italy. You know, that contrast creates a dynamic tension that you bring to your art. So, um, you know, those are the things that I'm looking for in a painting and, and getting to the root cause of why am I painting it. And from there, then it becomes a lot easier to know what I want to emphasize in the painting and go on and, and create the painting from there. It was an evolution to get to the point where I was actually designing the paintings. I think every artist goes through this. And in my own teaching, I've kind of developed uh, kind of three buckets of teaching. There's the technique stage that students have to go through, there's the composition, and then there's personal expression. And, you know, mature artists have gone through all of those phases. But as a beginning artist, you know, definitely um, I need to understand technique. You know, we have to start out with the basics. How do you draw something? How do you make an apple look like an apple? Um, you know, copying things. You go through that phase to build, you know, your muscle and skills in the technique because you can't say anything in art if you don't have a language to say it in. So definitely go through the technique stage, but then you don't want to get locked there because then it's just technical prowess. <laughs> you know, you're showing your technical skills. The next phase to go from uh, copying an object is to create a composition, create a painting. What do you want to say? How do you want a viewer to be engaged? How do you want someone's eye to move through the painting? So you take the leap from painting objects to now painting relationships. You're now painting in the language of art. You're thinking about the relationship of one shape to another, colors to one another, values to one another, and how you want to organize that all to create a painting that's compelling to look at, um, and also pleasing and beautiful to look at. So, yeah, there definitely was a point where I had to make that leap from the literal thinking to thinking in the language of art and making a clear 
an intentional design decision up front before I ever put brush to canvas. Hi, I'm Pat Fiorello and welcome to my workshop. In this video, I'm going to be sharing a method that will help you get clean, vibrant, luminous color and also paint more loosely. Specifically, we're going to do a painting of an outdoor floral scene and we're going to focus on color and achieving a sense of sunlight. So as you can tell, I love flowers, I love to paint them, and my approach is to capture the essence of flowers, uh, capture their beauty, capture their joy, and also to capture their vivid colors. You know, all of that's important to me. At the same time, I don't want to restrict myself or put pressure on myself that I have to get in every petal to communicate what a flower is about. I think what's most exciting about this video for students is that it will release them from the pressure to have to get everything perfect and right. Um, we're painting for joy, we're painting to feel alive and create something, so I want to get students back in touch with the joy of painting and, and just creating something from nothing. You have some inspiration, but then I want you to bring your own sense of brushwork, design, and simplification to the whole process so that you can let go of trying to get things right. This video will help your painting skills in a couple of ways. Number one, in terms of technique, we'll be looking at um, how to mix clean colors, how to do a value sketch, how to plan out your painting, and there's even a bonus section on how to mix natural looking green, which is a, an area that's typically a frustration for painters. But we also spend time thinking about how to paint with intention, how to be deliberate about the design in your painting. Uh, you may do a little plan up front for your painting, but I want you to start thinking about um, design with every stroke that you're putting down. We are creating um, a work of art beyond just copying what we see in front of us. And I want you to get back into the feeling of that, the energy of that, the freedom of that, um, and the joy that that'll bring to your painting experience. So if you want to paint more loosely, you want to have fun with color, you want to learn how to simplify and suggest and let go of the pressure of having to do every last detail perfectly, uh, come join me on this video lesson and let's get started.